I'm, an, that's to say so, an infectious disease guy, and uh, just as Ian, and I've been working on viruses and uh, other microbes. But, um, and, and the last 30 years, I really spent most of my time on, uh, on AIDS. Um, but when preparing and, and thinking about the theme of this evening, and that's uh, global health in the 21st century, um, and also knowing that Ian would cover very well emerging infections and, uh, and also the, um, how uh, some of the concepts that indeed we learned while we were medical students have been turned upside down, and I think more will come. I, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, I thought, well, let me um, look at what the other big issues are for uh, global health for this century. And uh, um, I'll briefly make four, five points uh, in terms of global health. Let me remind everybody that we've seen absolutely unprecedented improvement in health in the last, what did you say, 50 years or 20 years or 30 years, nearly everywhere. There are a few exceptions, like the Democratic Republic of Congo or Somalia and so on, nothing to do with um, health systems, but with uh, you know, civil unrest and war and so on. But it's absolutely um, unprecedented in history. Um, how um, we've uh, improved health and measured by any measure that you can take here. Uh, a classic one is life expectancy at birth. In 1950, um, I was just born, uh, then it was, we were still around 45 years life expectancy at birth. Today we are at 65 plus 67, and the extremes are uh, between Swaziland, where it's still around 45 45, it came down from about 55 because of AIDS. And, um, and then you have countries like Japan where we're way beyond um, the, the uh, global average. Um, there are, of course, oh, exceptions, and uh, it illustrates that we should never take any progress for granted. And who would have thought um, last century after my professors, uh, when I was trying to think what to do in the medical school, all told me that no future in infectious diseases. It's over. <laughs> this was in, literally, one said that in 1973. So, um, and he said, it's over. We have antibiotics and we've got vaccines, so don't worry and don't waste your time with something like that. And uh, I think we heard from <laughs> Ian what, in the meantime, I how many new pathogens have been, in fact, uh, have been discovered, humans, but also in, uh, in animals. And so there is AIDS, a pandemic uh, that has um, killed now 25 million people um, and that has resulted in um, a collapse of um, life expectancy in the worst affected countries. In many countries, it has not had that kind of impact. Uh, the countries that Marie talked about, um, I mean, in Thailand at some point, but not to the level that we see in Africa. That's the second lesson. So enormous progress, but it's very fragile. And I think we should take, uh, keep that in mind uh, when we talk about the new um, issues. Then I was thinking of what is one of the major characteristics of our time is the growing interconnectivity and connectivity of the whole world. Um, and using the cliche, we're a big village, but it's many villages, but we're so interconnected, uh, and we've seen it with the financial crisis, we've seen it every day with many issues also in health. And what does globalization mean for health? We heard about pathogens, much faster uh, spread, but it's also been a globalization of lifestyles. Probably the most important one, a very perverse one, it's been tobacco, the spread of and the marketing of tobacco, smoking, which is the number one killer in the world today, by far, as an underlying cause. Um, diets um, and the car. I'm not against cars or diet, it's not a, but it's just, it's been a globalization of that with many and major implications for, for health. Of course, migration, and here in London, the United Nations are in the street everywhere, wherever you see. Um, technology, social media, 
medical technology, and, uh, and everything has a pro and a con, you know. Healthcare provision is also being globalized, um, perhaps less in this country, but in many countries there is a now a global healthcare industry, and Marie knows this very well. And then we've got globalization of social movements, um, and AIDS and, and, and uh, the Green Movement are, are some of examples of that. Now, some of that also has very negative impacts. There, there is this very strong anti-science, anti-vaccine uh, lobby in the world. Um, and as a result, in many high-income countries, including in this country for a while, we saw a, de a dramatic decline in, um, in immunization rates with, as a, a result, um, children developing encephalitis from measles, uh, old diseases, infections coming back that uh, no young doctor would ever recognize because it would, they weren't there when they were uh, being in training. And also that is a global movement. It's, uh, you know, it pops up all over the world. We see, of course, there are crazy things like here you can see American parents selling chicken pox infected lollipops or organizing um, measles parties and so on so that uh, the children could become naturally infected and get naturally natural encephalitis and become naturally deaf. Um, but, you know, it is a, um, these are no longer isolated phenomena. When this happens in uh, any country, you know, through the internet and, uh, you know, and sometimes a little financial support, that becomes a global movement. So there are also a bit of problems. Now, what, <laughs> this is a place that is famous in the, Evolution, hard on evolution. And um, one of the, uh, the biggest crises that is looming now, and that is actually has the potential also to destroy not only, I think, the human race, but also uh, healthcare system, are uh, chronic diseases, non communicable diseases. Our systems were designed for acute illness. You come in, you either break a leg, you're repaired, or you have an infection you're cured and you go back into society. Uh, that's no longer the case with what is the number one cause of mortality. And uh, this is, uh, you know, Homo sapiens, uh, the history, and starting a bit before Homo sapiens. So there is a really uh, a true non-communicable disease crisis, which uh, the myth is that this is only a problem for rich countries, for, for, for us here in Western Europe and North America. That's no longer the true true because the majority of people with non-communicable diseases, and I indeed believe that some of that, not only a belief, but a proven by, of infectious nature, but they're chronic diseases, that um, the majority are now living in low and middle income countries. And everywhere in the world, except in sub-Saharan Africa, and that's because of AIDS and malaria particularly, and, um, and tuberculosis, it is the, by far the major cause of death and of premature death. It's not because people are getting older and that you have to die from something, as we sometimes sit here. And it's very much related to um, the development of wealth. Now, that, don't quote me on this and say that I'm against the de wealth development and, and economic growth. Um, it's absolutely necessary to get us out of poverty and also improving health. But there is a dramatic correlation between the development of wealth and a number of uh, chronic diseases. Uh, it's very well documented for here, as you can see, for uh, diabetes in uh, all kinds of South, South Asian, uh, Southeast Asian countries. Um, sorry. Then, and that's when, so that's my first uh, issue. There's a second issue. So first was globalization has an impact on health. Two, non-communicable diseases crisis. Thirdly is that something that got off the radar screen several, well, a few decades ago because of American religious wars, and that is population family planning. Um, here, in spite of the fact that um, there has been a uh, decline in number of new, um, you know, the, in the population growth per se, um, the number of people continues to grow and putting an enormous stress on not only many systems, but also on nature. And um, this um, is leading, that combined with, um, the, uh, with longevity, we're, we're all getting older, you know, the longer life expectancy, 
leads to uh, what is another time bomb, actually, and that is dementia, Alzheimer disease, and so on, which is growing at an astronomical, not astronomical, but at a major rate. And again, the, the, the largest growth we're seeing in low- and middle-income countries. This is no longer uh, something for, uh, you know, for the um, healthy, for the, the high-income countries. All this um, is then, uh, I would say, should be seen in the frame of a fourth point, and that is that climate change is real. Um, but the impact of climate change on health is something where we're only at the beginning, and it's not crystal clear what exactly it will be, although there are some things that you can kind of um, mathematically model um, particularly um, the correlation between increased temperature and, uh, for example, all kinds of insects, that arthropods that can uh, transmit um, various viruses. Um, so that's, that's clear. But there is much more that is, uh, that is going on. You can see here what we're seeing actually is perhaps more extreme events, uh, heat waves, etc. Um, and then we have a number of indirect mechanisms you can see here. But what it comes down to is that we will see, as a result uh, of extreme weather-related effects, a number of problems that are going from water-related diseases, foodborne, vector-borne, rodent-borne, and even malnutrition. And uh, remember, you know, only um, not that long ago, there was a, a first, for a long time, major heat wave in Europe, which killed uh, about 15,000 people just in France alone mostly older people and so. We are not prepared and we are likely to see more of that uh, in the future. Um, another example, um, since we are at the Royal Ge Geographic Society here, to see uh, Bangladesh, coastal Bangladesh. What we're seeing as a result of uh, sea level rise is a change in the flow of rivers um, that um, connected with um, extreme irrigation and then also um, with uh, shrimp farming, intensive shrimp farming, is that the salt level in the, uh, in the water and in the ground uh, in coastal area of Bangladesh, where there are about 20 million people living, um, has now reached levels that are no longer um, you know, um, healthy, to say the least. And one indicator is that you can see here on the bottom is that preeclampsia, this is a, um, a complication of uh, pregnancy, um, high blood pressure and puts the, the fetus and the mother at risk, but it's highest in the dry season when uh, salt levels are also extreme high. But I think we're only at the beginning of this impact of uh, climate change on health. Now, my final point is I'm always a um, kind of a positive guy and try to see what's the what, not only what's the problem, but what are the solutions, what can we do with it. And here it's very interesting. Um, many of the solutions are not in the medical field and require um, you know, uh, disciplines that come from everywhere. And take these chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases. Um, before people are actually ill, and that's when we need good medical care and all that. But um, before, what can we do to prevent it? It's tobacco control, it's salt and alcohol reduction, healthy diet, weight control, physical activity, indoor pollution reduction, all things that are far beyond the medical sphere and the health sphere. This is legislation, this is, uh, you know, the economic incentives, et cetera, et cetera, behavior. Um, and uh, that, that is why it's such a big challenge, I would say. Um, but the good news is also that we can sometimes catch two birds with one stone. Um, for example, this is a study that was done by my predecessor at the London School um, in, um, on the impact of uh, increased active transport, which means by basically walking and cycling in London, not without dangers. You look at the, uh, here, the road traffic crashes, so the number of people who killed. So if people cycle more, more people will be killed by cyclists, that's for sure, um, particularly since, you know, the, with all the, the, the road works, I don't see much... Uh, in terms of um, better uh, bicycle paths. But um, on the other hand, it will prevent not only, it will not only decrease CO2 emissions, but it also will have major beneficial 
um, you know, health impacts and saving actually far more lives than um, people are killed. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a macabre um, comparison, but you have to make this kind of economic analysis. Now, a question I, or, or a comment I often hear is that, okay, it's fine with new technology, innovation, and so on, because in this medical innovation is an explosion also. Uh, and they said, oh, but forget it for poor countries. They can't do that. I said, wait a minute. Do you know how many people in Africa today have a mobile phone? And look at Tanzania. You go in Tanzania because sometimes we go there. And they said, electricity is still very low coverage. There are generators, uh, high cost of fuel here and there, an occasion, uh, a solar panel. But you go into any village and you see a bar with a mega screen where they're following the British football competition. And they know the names of every player and so on. And the market has played there. And mobile phone coverage is now 70 to 80% across even rural Africa. It's close to. So we need m new models also. And in addition to the classic ways, immunization, healthcare, um, and so on, I also believe strongly that we should uh, make alliances that are not so classic. Very good example I find was in Bangladesh again, uh, where the Grameen Bank, the pioneer of uh, microcredit, uh, particularly to women, and Danone Foods, Danone Yogurt, you know, they, they join forces. And uh, Danone makes good profit, and uh, the Grameen Bank provides the money, and uh, malnutrition levels have uh, gone down tremendously. The general status of uh, both the health and the economic status, particularly of women, in these places have gone up. So I think this kind of, we need to, a lot of, far more out of the box thinking to, um, the, um, to ensure better health in, in the future, in, in global health in this century. And this is my last slide. So for me, it's not only about delivering innovation, because research, R&D, is bringing new, new tools, new, um, you know, as I said, vaccines and diagnostics and, um, and medical devices. But it's also that we need innovation in the delivery of, uh, of everything. And both are uh, equally challenging. And in an academic environment, the first, you know, the last point, innovation of delivery, that's what business schools do, perhaps, and not medical schools. So again, we need, again, we need to look far beyond our classic um, health professionals in order to deliver uh, good health uh, in the 21st century. So thank you very much.